We're getting ready for another busy day. This will be a walking tour with a local guide who will tell us all about the history. It is a pleasure to me to show you Innsbruck and to tell you something about Innsbruck. Innsbruck is very well known because it was twice the place of the Olympic Winter Games in 1964 and in 1976. What's not so well known is that Innsbruck had also been the residence town of the Habsburgs for more than 200 years, <coughs> exactly between 1420 and 1660. I don't know if you know about Habsburgs. The Habsburgs had been one of the most important dynasties in Europe, and they had been very, very powerful. So Tyrol had been the residence town of the Habsburgs, and so it also had been the residence of an emperor, of a German emperor, of Emperor Maximilian. And Emperor Maximilian, he was the founder of the Habsburgian Empire. He originally owned Austria and Tyrol. And the Tyrol used to be much larger than today because it reached the south to the lake of Garda near Verona. So you can see it here. And so when he ruled his country, this, this was so large that the sun never set. Can you imagine? And Innsbruck used to be the residence of such a huge country. But this is very, very long ago, because Emperor Maximilian, he ruled between 1490 and 1519, so nearly 500 years ago. In those days, also Tyrol was a very rich country, because Tyrol was rich in silver mines and copper mines. And this was also one of the reasons why the Habsburgs had a lot of interest in Tyrol. Yeah. And if you walk then through the old city of Innsbruck, I will show you a medieval city, a city of those days. I think we can walk now. Nice. Oh, we on the weather now. Oh. Yeah. Now we have a walk down there. Oh. We are here in the center of the old city and this old city is a very good example for a medieval city in the area along the river Inn, along the river Salzach and also in South Tyrol. Also the city of Salzburg was looking like Innsbruck before it was transformed into a baroque town. In the center we have a large court and right and left small alleyways. So the house is very, very small, but they are very deep. They have inside small courts for light and for fresh air, but these courts are very, very small. The house you can see here on the corner, this is a very good example for a Gothic house which had been transformed into Baroque. And here you find also pictures of our dear lady of Sacre. Typically, for this house is us, it's closed bay windows, can you see it? These windows are not beautiful for looking, they are also very practical because we have inside more light. Very interesting is also this picture here, this house here with these reliefs. These reliefs are representing uh, the tournaments. Maximilian, he liked very much tournaments and for this he had, he built the golden roof. I have here a picture so you have um, imagination and they were fighting here tournaments on horseback or not on horseback, it depended. Can you see it? Here is also a picture of Emperor Maximilian, so have, you have an imagination what he was looking like. There are existing a lot of pictures, portraits of Emperor Maximilian because he liked that everybody should know what he was looking like. This was uh, painted by Bernhard Striegel, so you know of whom I'm always talking, <laughs> yes? <laughs> 
He liked very much ladies. He had beside his wife eight ladies only for love. So we know it because this lady's got children and we know about this. And the last son, he became Archbishop of Salzburg. So you know. Now, the golden roof, this was built for the emperor to sit down, to look, see here on the place, the court, when there had been tournaments. And this golden roof is also a very good example for art between Gothic and Renaissance because the building itself is typically for the Gothic, but the reliefs, they are typically for the Renaissance because of the movements of the body. There was a lot of movement. I always tell this is the rock and roll of those days. In the center, you find Emperor Maximilian on the left side with his two wives, Mary of Burgundy with a high head, and the second wife, Bianca Maria Sforza. This golden roof is a just gilded copper plates. You find now the city hall, because we had been standing beneath the city hall, and this is our city tower. There used to be a guard looking around if a fire was broken out or if animals were coming into the town. And here is McDonald's, of course, very important. <laughs> Now, have a look at this beautiful late Gothic doorway. This is also of the 16th century. And please have a look to the ceilings. This is also a very typical late Gothic seating, ceiling. We call, we call this a fish-blowing ceiling. It's just for decoration. Because normally, in Gothic churches, the ceilings, the ripped ceilings, have also to carry the whole building. Here, the ceiling is only decoration. We'll continue our walking tour with the local guide in one minute. At that time, we'll show you a little bit more of the old town and we'll bring you inside the royal palace, the Hofburg. The old city of Innsbruck was surrounded by a city wall and had four city gates. One gate used to be here in, in the 18th century. It was broken down and with the rest of the city uh, gates they built the Triumph Arch, which is uh, on the end of this road. This road you can see here, this is our main road. This is Maria Theresien Straße. Inside the Maria Theresien Straße, we have beautiful shops and also beautiful baroque houses with different colors. You can see green and yellow and every very... The building on the end, on the left side with the flags, this is the seat of the Tyrolean government. In the center of Maria Theresa Street, we have a beautiful column. This is St. Anne's column. On the top of the column, you find our dear lady, Mary Virgin. And on the base, you would find St. Anne. And Innsbruck is a very, very Catholic town, still today. We have 36 Catholic churches and only two Protestant churches. Of course, we have a synagogue, we have other religions, but mostly we are Catholic. And today we have a population of about 130,000. And we have a university with about 30,000 students, so it's also very important for the economy. And in Austria, you don't have to pay a fee if you're studying a university. So it's very good for studying here. This uh, road iron signs had been to show people where are restaurants. And you must think in the earlier days people couldn't write and read. So it was very important to see these road iron, uh, iron signs and to find so your way. So Ute, what, were these homes upstairs here? Was it apartments? Private, private homes. Private, private homes. homes. But people didn't live very comfortable because in those days Innsbruck had a population of about 6,000 people. And mostly six, seven, eight people had only one room. There had been no sanitary fine things, nothing, no shower bus, uh, no bathroom. There had been small houses, we call it, there is no translation, secret houses. This had been the toilets, but there had been no sweeping away. The secret houses, the rest of the secret houses were swept into a river, a small river, which was fl uh, flowing through the middle of the roads and they threw inside everything. So you can imagine, it was very badly smelling. 
And also in those days, you must think this uh, inhabitants, they had their own chickens and pigs. And these chickens and pigs, they were running through the road. So you can imagine the smell was horrible. Mm -hmm. But this was medieval life. Not very romantic. We think always it was romantic. I don't think it was. Mm -hmm. today, yes. Today they're rented as apartments. Yes, these are apartments. Some are restored, very beautifully restored. Some are not beautifully restored, so it depends. Because we had also a lot of air rails during the Second World War. We had uh, 22 air rails, and 65% of the, uh, the city of the old city had been damaged. So. It was not very good, but it was very good. Those who had been damaged, they are now modernized. Those who are not, which are not da uh, damaged, they are still like in those days. So it depends what you prefer, romantic or facilities. <laughs> <laughs> now, please turn around, have a look to this monument. You can see Leopold V, this is a man who has his tomb in the Jesuit church and the husband of Claudia of Medici sitting on a horse. And this horse is very important for art history because it is the first time in art history a bronze horse is standing only on two legs. And now we we'll cross the road and we we'll have a visit to the court church. Yes, please. I do it. Now we are in the court church. And most important in this court church is this tomb. It is a tomb of Emperor Maximilian, who had been in power, I already told you, between 1490 and 1519. And he was the man who enlarged the Habsburgian Empire. Here we have 28 over life size statues in bronze, and they are representing members of the family of Maximilians, but also people he wanted to relate it with. Here, for example, we have his grandmother. This was started to be casted in 1504, so at the beginning of the 16th century. She was a very, very rich lady. On the opposite side, you will find his wife, First wife Mary of Burgundy. In front of the church, on the right side, you find a beautiful organ. This organ is a Renaissance organ. It was built in 1563. You must think a music instrument of 1563. And it's still played. And Innsbruck had been also in the 17th century a center of music, of the Baroque music. This tomb is a very good example for art between Gothic and Renaissance. Have a look to these two figures. This man, this would be the grandfather of the mother of Maximilian, Ferdinand of Portugal. He is standing here, very strong, very, very heavy, typical for the Gothic time. Have a look to this man. This is King Arda. And he is here because Maximilian, he believed in the ideals of the knights. And King Arthur, he was a leader of the knights, of the round table, the British king of Ewein, Garwein, Parzival, Lancelot. He was designed by Albrecht Dürer. He is one of the most important German artists of the 16th century. And here you find the contrapost, this is special for the Renaissance. Standing leg and playing leg. And for this, the whole body gets a special movement. The body is looking more natural. And this is typical for the Renaissance. We find this also in Italy, in Florence, for example, Donatello, Giovanni da Bologna. This is Renaissance and this is the Gothic. Very strong, very heavy. Now, I think you can remember the difference between Gothic time and Renaissance time. We'll continue our walking tour in just a few minutes, bringing you inside this royal palace, the Hofburg. But first, let's take a little break, do a little shopping, have lunch, and generally reflect on this great city. Well, a little bit of old and a little bit of new, I guess. Uh -huh. so. 
nothing that we see back home, that's for sure. Yeah. Different, very much so. Innsbruck is even different than most of the other historic towns of Europe because it's older. You get this medieval feeling from the arcades that are still preserved from the ancient days, dating back 500 years to the late Middle Ages, the early Renaissance. Most other cities of Europe have grown with the times. They, they might have become more of a Baroque city, representing a time period of the 18th century, 17th century perhaps. But here we're back into the 16th century and even as early as the 15th century. So it's ancient. And plus it's beautiful. It's a small place. It's easily managed. Some of the buildings have been later developed here in a Baroque style, for example. And of course, there's a more modern part of town that's only a few hundred years old, a couple blocks away up Maria Theresa Strasse that we'll show you shortly. The most famous historic landmark in town, the golden roof of Emperor Maximilian. Built about 500 years ago, the emperor would sit up here in his box and watch the festivities down below in the market square. We'll tell you more about this place in our walking tour that's going to continue in just a few minutes. For now, we're poking around town, having a look at some of the restaurants and some of the shops, some of the kinds of things that you can buy when you're here. There's always unique souvenirs in any distinct region in Europe. And here in the Tyrol, you'll find a lot of alpine type things to purchase and bring home with you, and some great food to consume on the spot. We're enjoying the restaurant of the Golden Eagle Hotel. This hotel has been here for 600 years. Napoleon stayed here, hundreds of other dignitaries. The spinach gnocchi and deer filet were fantastic. It was mentioned earlier the two main activities of travelers are taking pictures and shopping, to which we must quickly add a third activity, and that, of course, is eating. If you've been watching World Traveler regularly, you'll know we always eat a lot. We go to the restaurants, we'll grab a light bite. You can just get a takeout sandwich if you like, or visit a bakery and get a pastry. Which one did you get? Let's point to the Austrian pastry, German pastry. They're all fantastic. Or you can get the rich, hearty breads, build your own sandwich. Some people prefer a light lunch because they're busy touring and sightseeing, so you just want to grab a little snack. German bread is among the darkest and richest bread that you can find anywhere. And that's what they feature here in Innsbruck, Austria. There's a lot of the Germanic culture, of course, in Austria. They speak German. They have a close historic tie with Germany. And they have a bit of a Germanic attitude, although in Austria you'll find the people are considerably more relaxed and easygoing than your typical German personality. They're a little bit less driven, a little bit more Southern European, on the fringe, more country folk very friendly people to be around. With our Alpine tour, we've deliberately chosen a mix of countries and cultures to visit. Here's a fountain that looks like a harp. We started in Italy, in Rome, and headed north to northern Italy, Murano, and now we're in Austria. Next, we'll be going to Switzerland for a few weeks and then back to Italy. So stay tuned as this tour unfolds. And now, let's rejoin our guide in the tour of the Grand Palace. You remember, Innsbruck had been more than 200 years the residence town of the Habsburgs between 1420 and 1665. Afterwards, the residence of the Habsburg had been only in Vienna. We know exactly what this palace was looking like in those days because it exists a picture by Albrecht Dürer. I already told you about Albrecht Dürer representing this palace of 1494, because Albrecht Dürer was visiting Innsbruck in those days. He was traveling to Venice. Like you can see today's imperial palace, it was restored in the time of Maria Theresa. Maria Theresa had been in power exactly between 1740 and 1780, so in the 18th century. So this palace today is late Baroque. 
have a look to the beautiful road iron balconies with the initials of Maria Theresia. Inside there are 400 rooms, but most of the rooms are offices and also private apartments. So we don't visit now 400 rooms, we are only visiting some rooms which had been used for representation. Now, this imperial palace was restored when Empress Maria Theresa was in power. She used to be in Vienna and she had been only twice in Innsbruck. Maria Theresa transformed this room in a chapel. And now have a look at these beautiful paintings in the back. These are not reliefs, these are paintings. We call this kind of paintings this gray in gray, grisai painting. So this is not a relief, this is real painting. And also very beautiful, these figures are made of alabaster. Showing in the middle our dear lady Mary Virgin with her dead son, and here two saints, Teresa and Anna, praying to God. So this is also beautiful work of alabaster of the 18th century. Now, the Habsburgs had to fight since the 14th century against the Turkish people. You know, the Turkish people had been Islamic and they tried to run over Europe. And these pictures you can see here are remembering to this different battle, great battles against the Turkish. Isn't it beautiful? It's a ballroom, isn't it? for dancing. Now, this is a giant hall. And very beautiful in this room. Also, the painting, a fresco in the ceiling by Franz Anton Maulbert. She had been one of the most important Baroque painters of Austria. So I think it's a very beautiful room. We use this room still today for conventions. And also, I already told you, in August, we have the festival of early music. We have here concerts on old instruments of the 15th, 16th, 17th century. So you can imagine, it's really very, very lovely. Have a look also at the beautiful lamps, lights. So would you describe this as Rococo or Baroque? This is Rococo. Mm -hmm. Baroque. So after the Thirty Year War. The Thirty Year War was a war between the Protestants and the Catholics between 1618 and 1648. So around 1650, you find in all Catholic countries of Europe a new style we call Baroque. And Baroque is characterized by a lot of heavy plastered stucco work which is in the beginning always totally white and totally symmetric. Baroque ended with the French Revolution, so around 1790. And the end time of Baroque we call Rococo. And one of the most important differences between Baroque and Rococo is that the plaster stucco work in Rococo is not so heavy is sometimes pastel colored or gilded and is not exactly symmetric. And you find also here in the corner, this is typically for Rococo, it's not so heavy. The plaster stucco work is not so heavy, is gilded and is not exactly symmetric because of the rocai, which is characterizing for the Rococo. So around, the Rococo starts around 1750 to 1790. And Baroque started in 1650, so 100 years earlier. Here you find a beautiful table with beautiful china. You can find this china is from Vienna, from Augarten. This is one of our most important factories for China. It's very, still very expensive. And have a look to the beautiful, this is a typically Rococo stove in the corner. It's very interesting. The most of these uh, stoves are heated from outside. So we had no dirt here in these rooms. Some are heated from inside, but most of them are heated from outside. So this was very practical, no dirt inside. And here you find it's not exactly symmetric. Can you see it? Yes. 
And this is typically for Rococo. Let me go to the next room. Here we have beautiful tapestries of the 18th century. These are Flemish works, you can see here. Beautiful, again, a beautiful stove in the corner, and also have a look to the beautiful furniture. This is all original furniture. Now, here we had receptions. So again, beautiful furniture, and very, very interest, interesting in this room is here. This family tableau representing the family of Maria Theresa. She had 16 children. If you will count this, you will find 17, because there's also shown the first grandchild of Maria Theresa, the daughter of Joseph II. The family is still alive. There are a lot of members, because they always had a lot of sh children, and they still have a lot of children. <laughs> so you can imagine. In 1918, Tyrol was divided in two parts. I already told you, Tyrol used to be much larger. It reached down in the south to the Gardasee. In 1918, the country was divided. The northern part came to Austria, and the southern part came to Italy. As you can see in our tours and our World Traveler program, we like to go into some depth and learn about the history, some about the politics, the lifestyle, the architecture, the art history of the people, instead of just dropping into a town for half a day and doing some souvenir shopping and then moving on to the next town. Now let's have a look inside this beautiful cathedral. We are here in the Cathedral of Innsbruck. And this cathedral is a very good example for a high baroque building. Baroque you find after 1650 in all European Catholic countries. This cathedral was built in the beginning of the 18th century, exactly between 1717 and 1724, so only seven years. It was designed by two Bavarian architects. These are Bavarian, but you must think that most of the architects and the artists, they had been also introduced by Italian art, always, because mm -hmm. always German artists went down to Italy and learned Italian art. So Italy always has his influence in our art. But uh, the Baroque art in Austria is very specialized. And this building is a very interesting building because, in reality, this building has only one cupola here over the altar. And this is very unusual because normally the cupola is always here in the center. These three domes, these three cupolas, in reality, a flat wooden ceiling. It's only painted like a cupola. Here you find the different events of the life of St. James, to whom this church is dedicated. Have a look at the beautiful Baroque decorated organ. Isn't it beautiful? It's really very beautiful decorated with gold and ornaments, and everything is gilded, so it's really great. And also beautiful this pulpit. In earlier days, the priest used to go up there and to preach from there. They damned you from there. You are a bad man because you ate too much sugar. So for example, so you, you get trembling, you must imagine. In this church, everything is covered with real marble. Red marble, black marble, white marble, so really very beautiful. Very beautiful, this gilded <laughs> silver altar of the 18th century. And very important, you find this picture of Our Dear Lady of Sacre, and this was painted by Lukas Karnach in 1535. And very nice in this are the columns. These columns are spiral shaped, and they had been designed by Caspar Kras, the same man who designed the horse with the two legs. Before Bernini designed the spiral shaped columns in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. In a Baroque or Rococo church, you will never find windows with stained glass because 
for Rococo and Baroque is a lot of light necessary. Where you have a lot of light, you also have a lot of shadow. And this is very important for the sculptures because it was one of the intentions of Baroque to bring heaven down on earth. Baroque, the plaster stucco work is heavy. Have a look to the plaster stucco work here and always totally symmetric. In Rococo, the plaster stucco work is not so heavy and is not totally symmetric. Do you know now the difference? You will remember always, yes? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No more? Then we leave the church. I say you thank you for paying me attention. I can wish you a nice time. I hope weather will become better. And have a nice time also in Switzerland. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.